Okay, I need help going to read math workshops, and I got way too much math to do today. So I'm going to be quiet. Okay, let's start with so I got caught up in major C's, and I guess I was out. I really don't know what happened. It's probably got this far behind, but we're so far behind that the main Aberdeen trade teacher lady, Ms. Lennon, she's giving a test at what quiz on the section that we're starting today on Tuesday, I mean tomorrow. And I don't think, I mean, I mean we're just starting it today. But so we've got to get back on track. So we're going to cut a little corners, and then, yeah, I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to talk really fast this section. So if talking fast slows you down, you are going to need to rewatch this one on YouTube. Oh, my goodness. So let's talk about the math workshop, and then let's get started on the new notes for today. So we, we're going to cut a little corner so we can get caught back up to everyone else. Plus, again, when I get excited and need to get stuff done, I talk fast. You've been warned. Okay, on number 11. You were super chatty. You know how these done? Why? Why, why? 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 I don't care who has it. No, apparently no one does. Yes, dear. How many weeks worth of bell ringers have we done? I feel like a thousand, but that's a bad guess. I mean, at least nine weeks. And then we were like, what, four weeks in? So 13 weeks worth of bell ringers? And I feel like we've been simplifying radicals for a long, long time now. So when last period, I was telling Sarah about this earlier. Someone last period said, I still don't understand how to do this. I said, bless your heart, because he needs to come to zero period. He needs to phone a friend. He needs to do something because eventually there's a math workshop test. So he needs to understand how to do these on his own. Okay, now that I'm done lecturing, I pray someone please answer this for me. Ma'am. Thirty six Y to the fifth, and what? And then what? What's left? Okay, so I know the square root of 16 is 4, so 9 times 4, that's how she got 36. 10 divided by 2 is 5, that's how she got y to the 5th. z to the 3rd was an odd exponent, so there was a z left under the house. z2 divided by 2 ended up being z to the 1, we don't write the 1. Number 11 was the easy one. 12 was a little harder. I need two numbers, one of them needs to be a perfect square. Or choose on purpose one. Okay, let's see now now here's how we got behind because you were supposed to already have these done. We were just supposed to be going over the answers. We were supposed to already have forty nine times two because we were super chatty at the beginning, so I don't understand. 49 times 2 is 98. Square root of 49 is 7. So it's 7 square root of 2. But I, the J's come out and you have J to the what power? Eight. 2 and 5 get the point. Yeah. Finally, we're not dealing with radicals. Finally, we are looking at something new to our math workshops, but new to you? No. You learned rules of exponents years ago. When they have the same base, you're supposed to. Just add them. So our answer is X to the. Yes, Xavier said it first. He was the adding of the 11th. So, can someone else tell me the next one? And then why to the? Yes. <laughs> Table 3 gets the point. Literally just adding. 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 11 plus 1 is 15. Perfect. Thank you, DJ. Number 15. Say it again. Yes, but we know what two to the third is. So it's eight a to the ninth. We'll give you the point anyway, table one. Okay, the sixteen we're dividing, and I'll give four point two because he helped fix it. Uh, it is we're supposed to subtract, so so it's eight to the negative two, but we can't leave it with a negative exponent, so it's 
What are we? Well, yes, yeah. we make it into a fraction. Table three gets a point. One over a squared. We're not allowed to leave it as a negative exponent. We end up pushing it to the denominator to make it one over a squared. That was a rule you had about exponents. We are going to do 17 and 18 tomorrow. Are there any questions about this? I have some of your tests done. Bless your heart, third period. Third in line grading. So I finished up first and second. I got about halfway through third. Maybe I'll finish up the rest of the half. If you're interested, it should be on I now by sometime tonight. They're easy grades. So far, so good for most. I can tell you that much. Yes, here. Yes, I do, right up here. Okay, while he's doing that, look at your new packet for two points. Tell me what's different. Oh, it doesn't have that little thing on the front. It has a little thing on the front. Have one. Yes, yeah, it has learning targets. Five, uh, four gets the point. It has the learning targets. Um, so we don't have a list of learning targets for this section. Our bad. I'm writing them out on the board every day. You do not have to. I'm making a list. I will copy it when we get to the end of the unit and give it to you. So you're not going to have them up front this time. That's my bad. I uh, didn't realize that until today. Like you, I am sometimes off my game. Um, but today we're going to graph quadratic functions. That's what the top one says. You actually already graph quadratic functions in your algebra 1 class. It's just been a while. If you remembered linear, but for some reason you block out quadratic, and now the struggle is going to be real. Okay, in a quadratic function, the greatest exponent is a 2. So if there's anything higher than a 2, it's not a quadratic function. We technically call the x squared term the quadratic term. The term that just has a plain old x to the first power, we call it the linear term. And the term that's just a number, we call a constant, which makes sense. <coughs> now, never in my life, and I've been around for a while, so I haven't looked at the test, but never in my life has someone said, hey, on this quadratic, what is this middle term called? The linear term. I've never heard that. So it's okay if you don't remember those three things. However, it is not okay if you forget the next blank. I would go ahead and put a star by it. The graph of a quadratic function is called a... It's called a parabola. You're supposed to know that too. It's called a parabola. So from here on out, you need to know that word. <coughs> so the reason it's called a parabola, I always think of a bowl. It kind of does look like a bowl. Maybe I could put some sort of food inside of it. Parabola. It could hold some sort of something. Just like with any other function, if you had a list of ordered pairs, you could plot the points connect the dots, and call it a day. Okay, so we're going to cheat a little. We're supposed to do the like all the notes today only with by hand. And we're going to do the first one by hand. And then after that, we're going to use our handy-dandy graphing calculator. Now, is it important to know how to do things by hand later on in life? Probably. It's not a bad idea. But on a standardized test, or on my test even, am I going to take the graph and calculator away from you? No, I'm not. Before I go crazy, there is something I've forgotten to do, and it's very important. We are going to take our perfect cubes test next Tuesday. Let's go over 0, 1, 2, and 3. What is 0 cubed? What's 1 cubed? What's 2 cubed? What's 3 cubed? 27. And if you know the first couple, then you're new and good. If you did not say anything out loud, bless your heart, it's next Tuesday going into 60. Tuesday. Okay, we need to know specific things about a parabola. <coughs> so we've got this graph. We're calling it a parabola. And there are specific parts of this graph that we need to focus on. The first thing we're going to focus on is what's called the y-intercept. That's where it's crossing the y-axis. And that's actually kind of easy to figure out. It's probably the easiest thing we're going to talk about today because of the x-coordinate. If we're crossing the y-axis, what is the x-coordinate? Three is another point. If we're, if we're crossing the y-axis, the x-coordinate has to be 0. We didn't move any left or right. We only went up. So it's 0 some number. <clears throat> so to figure out where, 
like on number one, where we're crossing that y-axis, we're genuinely just going to plug in zeros. So they give you an example at the top. If you plugged in zeros, it ends up being just the constant term. So down here on number one, for our y-intercept, if we plugged in zeros, it would be zero squared. That would go away. Minus six times zero, that would go away. So our intercept is at eight. So our intercept is at zero, eight. Any questions about that? Zero squared, negative six times zero. So everything but the constant goes away when you plug in a zero. So our intercept is always whatever that constant number is. So that's the first thing we need to know today, the y-intercept. The second thing we need to know is something called the axis of symmetry. Now, as always in life, there is a cute little formula for the axis of symmetry, which we're going to talk about in a second. Before we talk about how to calculate the axis of symmetry, let's talk about what the axis of symmetry is. So if you're looking up at the top, see if I can zoom out and have both at the same time. If you're looking up at the top, there's this picture and there's this dotted line. The dotted line cutting down the middle of that parabola is the axis of symmetry. When I think axis of symmetry, I think of scissors. Meaning if I gave Abby Grace a picture of a parabola and I said, hey, cut this parabola in half, the axis of symmetry is where she would go to cutting. So where would you cut them in half? That's where you would go to cutting. So the reason parabolas are so cool, I told geometry for years, so I really love parabolas, is because they're symmetric. They're, meaning they, they reflect each other. If we have one half, we pretty much know the other half. They match. They're mirror images. So seriously, if I hand Jalen the scissors and say, cut this bad boy in half, the line she would cut them down is the axis of symmetry. Now we can calculate it. It says there's a formula for it. It is negative b over 2a. Now that formula is important later on in life. Do you have to know it to be successful in this next test? No. But if you're thinking pre-cal and beyond, it's a good one to go ahead and learn. It came up a lot. Okay, so for us, if we're wanting to calculate that axis of symmetry, we know it's x equals negative b over 2a. But I guess I should ask a really obvious question first. What form is our equation in? What form is that equation in? Um, it's in uh, standard. <laughs> it's in standard yeah. form. Thank you, Travis. You can have the point. It's in standard form. So you thought standard form was never going to be useful, and here it is being useful. Standard form was ax squared or it was ax plus by plus c. Anyway, so for us, it's ax squared plus bx plus c. <coughs> so we need our equation to be in standard form if we're going to plug it in this formula, because otherwise, how do you know what's the b, what's the 2a? You don't know. So we need this in order to plug it in this formula. So if it was in the wrong order, we would need to rearrange it. Okay, so for us, 2a... Well, a is 1, because there's no number in front. So 2 times 1. Negative b, well, b is that middle number. It's a negative 6. So I end up having positive 6 over 2, which reduces to 3. So seriously, if we were going to get out our scissors, we would cut it down 3. So I'm going to draw me a, it's going to be an ugly, but a quick sketch of a graph. You and I just found out that if we were to cut down 3, that's where we would cut this bad boy in half. And we already knew our intercept was at 0, 8, so I can add that. So, so far we've got one point and where to cut. <laughs> Are there any questions about the axis of symmetry? Well, then you're going to love this. So, we now need to find the last thing we're going to talk about. Well, it's not the last thing, but the next important thing we're going to talk about is a vertex. Okay, so if we're looking 
at this picture up here. The vertex happens, and it looks like if we pretended that the parabola was, let's say, it looks like it's a valley. The very, very bottom of that valley is where that vertex occurs. If our parabola looked more like a mountain, the very, very top of the mountain is where the vertex would occur. The vertex either happens at the very bottom or the very top. And we need to know its ordered pair. What is interesting about the vertex in that sample, what's it also crossing? It is crossing the, what's that blue line? The axis of symmetry. So our vertex is not only at the very bottom or at the very top, but it's also exactly where we would make our cut. So seriously, the x coordinate is the same number we use for our axis of symmetry. So for instance, with us, since our axis of symmetry is 3, our vertex is 3 something. We just got to figure out the something. So once you already know the axis of symmetry, you know the x coordinate of the vertex. That's what that third thing down is talking about. X coordinate of the vertex is the number you already calculated. So down in our example, since our axis of symmetry was 3, sorry, 3, our vertex is at 3 some number. We just got to figure out the number. Now figuring out the number is really easy. We're going to go back to our function. Our function used to be f at x. And we're going to plug in a 3. We want to know the y value when x is 3. So instead of being x squared, it'll be 3 squared. Instead of negative 6 times x, it's negative 6 times 3. And then plus 18. So everywhere I used to see an x, I've now plugged in a 3. What number do I end up getting? Oh. No. You end up getting minus one at a grocery point because it's nine minus eighteen plus eight, so it ends up being negative nine plus eight. It ends up being negative one. So our vertex is at three negative one. So if we're going to add to our little picture over here. At 3, negative 1, that's our vertex. Okay, so you and I have found the y-intercept, the axis of symmetry, and the vertex. But so far we have how many points graphed? Two, and that's kind of a problem. I think, other people may disagree with me in life, but I'm, I feel pretty confident with myself on this. I think you have a pretty good parabola if you've got at least three points. So we're one point shy of having a pretty good parabola. So, I, you know, I can see this side. But what's cool, because it is, and I did terrible with my mirror image, but because it's supposed to be a mirror image, I actually know a point on that side as well. So yeah, we have 0, 8, and 3, negative 1, but because the parabola is symmetric, I actually know a point over here as well. Does anyone know what that point is? It'd be, it'd be six, it would be 6, 8. You can have two points. Now you understand why it's 8, because they're supposed to, and this comes into a terrible job, but they're supposed to be at the same height, so it makes sense that they both have a y coordinate of 8. As to how Landon came up with the x coordinate of 6, he thought at 3. He knew from 0, which is where we started with that intercept, to that axis of symmetry, he went over 3 units. And since it's reflected, he went over 3 more units the other way. And that's how he got 6, 8. So seriously, if we just know a point on the left side of the problem, we automatically can figure out a point on the right side because it is reflective. So you have way less work to do in life, one would think. I say you have way less work to do, and in case you haven't looked, there's like F, E parts we're supposed to do. So let's see. Part A said find the y-intercept, the equation of axis symmetry, and the vertex. We did that. 
we did not make a table of values. If you want to make a table of values, like x and f of x or x and y, you can with the 0, 8, the 6, 8, and the 3, negative 1. No one's saying you can't. But again, on the very next problem, I'm going to show Sarah how to put it in her calculator. And the calculator has a table button. So the calculator can make us a table. We don't have to make our own table by hand. That's going to slow us down. Pass. So you can cross that one out. We're not doing that. We did use the information to graph the function. We didn't do it on graph paper, but we did a pretty cute little sketch. We did good. Uh, however, we've not done D or E, so we're still not done with this one problem because we've not done D or E. <coughs> Goodness gracious. So part D wants to know if it's a min or a max. <coughs> For us, it is a min. And now we need to know where did that min happen, meaning what was that y value? At the lowest point, what was the y value? Three. I'm at yeah. And you can have a point out, I guess. Okay, so let's go back to that generic picture up at the top. I'm going to do that and put both. Okay. The vertex either happens at the very bottom, which makes sense. That's a min. That's as low as you could go. Or the vertex happens at the very top, which would be the max, because that's as high as you can go. So if you know the vertex, you know if it's a min or max. Normally they only want the y value, but if you put both, I'm not going to count off. The fact that you recognize min, max, go with vertex, you're good to go. The important thing is it can only have one. It is either a min or it is a max. It cannot be both. <coughs> so we had a min at negative one. Perfect. So yay, we did part B. Too bad, we're on part E. And suddenly your favorite words have come back to haunt you. We need to know the domain and the range of this function. If you stank, stank was a terrible word, let me rephrase that. <laughs> Let's phrase it completely If you enjoyed finding the domain and range of piecewise, this is so much easier than that. Parabola, like piecewise, is as hard as it gets with domain and range. Parabolas are so much easier. If I'm driving down the x-axis, is there any place where I can't reach out and touch my orange graph? No. So what am I going to put for domain? Two. Yes. So we're going to put the interval negative infinity to infinity. 95% of the time. 90, I would even go higher than that, but we'll say 95. 95% of the time, the answer for domain is negative infinity infinity when it's a parabola. The only 5% that it's not is if they turn it into a real world problem and they restrict the domain. Because you understand, like, if, we're, if this is time, we can't go negative, that kind of thing. But besides that, if it's just a, hey, graph me, domain is always negative infinity infinity. Always. Okay, as for the range, yes, dear. Mm -hmm. As for the range, I need some help with that. The range is the only part that requires a little thought because we could not always reach out and touch it. Yes, dear. Would it be? Uh, I want to say it would be. Um, it would be like. And that would be 100% correct, and I would give you some thanks. Okay, so again, we're trying to figure out when we're on the y-axis, when can we reach out and touch our function? We couldn't touch him below that min. It never happened. He didn't exist below there. We started touching him at negative 1, and then from then on out, we were able to touch him. So it's negative 1 to infinity. The range is always something restricted like this. Now, if it is a max, it might be negative infinity to a different number. It might involve a negative infinity, but it's always going to be a number and one of the infinities. Okay, are there any questions about this? That was a whole bunch of work to do for one thing. I get, I get that. I never said quadratics weren't annoying. They are, but they're sadly really, really important, especially in algebra trick. So look to the next page, to number two. Let's make up a list of the things we need in here.
We need to know. Let's see. We need to know the y-intercepts. You have a point. We need to know the the axis of symmetry. We need to know the vertex. We need to know if it's a min or a max. We need to know its domain and its range. Xavier was completely correct. Automatically from looking at the equation, I know the intercept is 0, 6. I also know something else. Travis gets the point because I'm telling you, like, I'm going to guess this bad boy every single time. The domain is going to be that. We haven't even grasped him. We haven't even looked at really at anything. And we're already able to fill in two things. We just need to grasp to figure out the axis of symmetry, the vertex, the min, max, and the range. If you want to continue going by hand and calculating the negative b over 2a, and put, like if you understood what we did on the previous page, that's awesome. Keep doing that. But a lot of people can't. So we're going to talk about how to put in the calculator now. Press on on your calculator. Press Y equals. We want to graph it. But the only way we're going to get it graphed correctly is if we press the right buttons. If we don't press the right buttons, it's not going to give us the right graph. We're going to have all the wrong answers. So our equation is negative 5X squared minus 10X plus 6. What button should I press first? Which one? The little, the, little the little one. The little one. Bless you. Table one gets the point. Negative yeah. five. Woo. Then X is that button that has X, T, theta, and N on it. Press it. So negative five X. And then what's cool is your calculator has a squared button. Yes, Travis? The axis of symmetry is at negative one. Yes, dear. You can have a point for that. But let the rest of us catch up on her. Okay, so I did negative five X. Notice the squared button is right below that inverse button we've been pressing. So I've got negative 5x squared. And now I'm going to do minus 10x and then plus 6. I can't put both on the screen at the same time, maybe at all. Is there anyone confused about how you get negative 5x squared minus 10x plus 6? X is the X, T, theta, N. It's right next to alpha. Is you just picking a different variable? Okay. Okay, is there anyone else who can't get this part typed in and needs help with this? Okay, then press graph. So we press graph, and I don't know about you, but people are messing with the zoom, so yours might be zoomed weird. I know mine is. So once you press graph, if your picture is not on the screen, it's not a big deal. You just need to change the zoom. So press the button that says zoom. Now the most common use zoom is the one that says standard, number six. <laughs> zoom standard means it puts it on a normal 10 by 10, you know, negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10. Now, that doesn't really help us for this specific problem. Why? What's it not showing? The vertex. Thank you, table for you and point. So I'm going to leave it right here for a second to show you something else because we can check what he did. You didn't press the right negative sign. It graphed it. It graphed it Yeah. 
had an extra symbol type in one too. I think that's why I was mad. Okay. So I'm going to leave it right here just to prove a point. So we understand how they figured out 0, 6 for the intercept, but our calculator knows that as well. If you press, so we're going to learn all the buttons today. There's lots of buttons that you can press. Just like with your phone, there are lots of cool things it can do. You press the trace button, it tells you for sure at 0, my y value is 6. So if you're questioning whether or not you picked the right y intercept, your calculator knows. I press the trace button. Yes, Xavier. I was going to say press the trace. Yes, we're going to press the trace. You can, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to press. So trace is great, except trace. So if you start playing around and like moving your, your cursor over, it does a lot of decimals, and that gets really confusing. So trace is useful-ish, not really. I don't really use trace. So the way to figure out stuff instead, I'm going to show you two different ways. You just got to pick which one you like. So the first one is the one Xavier suggested. So I'm going to press second and then table and look at my table of values that go with this function. <coughs> okay, sorry, I had to adjust my table. So here's my table. What's really cool about your table is that you can actually scroll up or down on it. And so let's answer a question. Is it supposed to be a min or a max? Look at your graph. It was supposed to be a max. So since it's a max, what we want to do when we press second table is find the highest y value possible. What's the largest y value you see on your screen? I heard it. That's the highest y value you see? Scroll. Scroll and look and make sure. I see 6, 11, 6, so it goes to 11 and then comes back down, so yes, so it's got a max at 11, but more than that, once I know where that max is, the max happened at the vertex, so that means the vertex was negative 1, 11, which means the axis of symmetry was x equals negative 1. So seriously, just by finding that one number, well, I had to acknowledge it was supposed to be a max. If it was going to be a min, we would look for the smallest, but it makes sense. Max, we're looking for the largest. Once we found the largest, we know not only where that max happened, where that vertex is, and where that axis of symmetry is. And more than that, we can probably guess the range. If the max is at 11, then that means our top was at 11. So we went all the way from negative infinity on up until 11. We couldn't go any higher. So seriously, once we found the max, we found vertex, axis of symmetry, and the range. So if Naya's topped it wrong and she guesses the wrong max, she guesses the wrong axis of symmetry, the wrong vertex, and the wrong range. She guesses all the wrong things, which is terrible. Because now she's blown the whole problem and she actually kind of knew what she was doing. So, let's talk about things. There is one slight, so this is going to work. Bless you, table, for helping me. And normally, the table is your BFF. Why would you be mad at the table sometimes? What, where's its faults? What's wrong with the table? How do we really know that negative 111 is for, for real the top? Because it's, is it counting by specific numbers? Isn't it counting by whole numbers? Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. What if the, the vertex was 2.5 or 3.7 or 2 and 5 eighths? And then what are we going to do? If it's anything but a whole number, we're SOL. So, how to handle that? There are two different ways. So I would probably do it this way and then start being suspicious maybe. We'll talk about when to be suspicious another day. You can always change your table. So we're going to talk about some of the blue buttons right now. We've already talked about how to do second table. Let's do second and then table set. If you press second and then table set, that's where you go to control your table. So Xavier can pick, I want my table to start at this number. I want my table, the delta TBL or the little triangle TBL, tells you how I want it to count. And yours is probably set on ones. I want it to count one, two, three, four, five. But if he wants it to count by halves, he can tell it 0.5.
And so when he presses the second table, lo and behold, it's counting by halves. Or if he wants to count by tens, he'll put point one. So you can make your table count by decimals. That's one way you could warn off any decimals. There is another way. Okay, are there any questions about us in second table? Okay, so you're never going to get to press stat plot unless you take me with AP stats, which would be awesome. Sorry, but you're not in stats. So you'll never get to press stat plot. Format is really weird, and we don't normally mess with it. It's if you're wanting to, like, turn on, if you don't want to see the X and Y axis, if you want to see the grid itself. It's really weird. No one normally messes with that. The last one we are going to mess with is calculate. So press second and calculate. Second calculate is better than the table button. Now it requires a little more understanding than the table button does, but it never, ever, ever lets you down, whereas the table button can. With second calculate, you can tell it stuff. Like you can tell it a specific value. I want to know when x is zero. Hold on, it takes a second. So when x is zero, what is y? It tells me. So I could say second calculate value when x is one, what is y? It could tell you. It could tell you all the points you've ever wanted to plot that you were getting from that table. But even cooler than that, it can tell you specific zeros, but it has min and max. We decided ours was a max, so I'm going to pick the max button. Now here is why calculate requires a little more precision. It requires you to set bounds because, you know, our quadratic only has the one hump, but there's potential for a graph with a lot of maxes. So it wants us to be restricted as to where that max is happening. So we pick a spot a little to the left, a spot a little to the right. You guess somewhere in between. You really don't even have to make a good guess. It's going to tell you the answer. And then it tells you the answer. So for my left bound, I seriously pick a spot a little to the left. Notice my little monster cursor. I put him a little to the left of where I think that, <coughs> that top point is. And then once I've set it, it tells you where you set it at. Then I pick a spot a little to the right. And then it tells you where I set it at. And then I make a guess. And I can make a terrible guess. It doesn't matter where I make my guess. It's going to tell me the answer. The answer is negative 111, which is what we already got from the table. So it really wasn't very useful since we were on whole numbers. But if we were ever in a decimal situation, second calculate could save the day. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay, well then, if you'll give me each of the answers to number three, I'll give you a point per each of the answers, and then we'll stop talking. You have them all? We're not going to let you have all the points, Travis. We do love you there. Yes, so we'll let three, uh, three has the first point. The y-intercept is at zero, five. Perfect. Let's do that. The domain is negative infinity infinity. We'll let table one have that. Travis, wait, and I'll let you do the hard one. <coughs> okay, um, let's see. So we've got the y-intercept. We've got the domain. We need the axis of symmetry. Travis, you can have it, but don't tell me anymore. And then we need the vertex. Obviously, the x coordinate is 2 since the axis of symmetry was it 2. Travis, if you're trying to get ahead, go to page 7. Is it a min? Is it a max? It's a min and it's negative 3, right? It is a min and it is at negative 3, and you can have another point, and then someone connect the dots and give the vertex besides table 5. Okay, table five. Oh, never mind. Table two finally got together. Good. If we know the max, we know the y coordinate of the vertex. <laughs> Just like the axis of symmetry is the x, the max and the min of the max is the y. Uh, and then the range is. It's a min at negative three, so it's negative three to infinity. Yes, we'll give it to you. Okay, but seriously, Travis figured all this out from his graph. If you were trying to get a head start on your life, because I know you don't have time today, but page seven, and it's the same problem top and bottom. It's got like seven of these. 
and you know they take a couple minutes, so it wouldn't hurt to do one. Wouldn't I kill you? You have a checkpoint at the end of class tomorrow, so sorry. I'm telling you we'd be flying on this. If you were not listening or did not understand, you've got